Greetings folks. Today we're going to take a look at mesh analysis. Mesh analysis is another technique we can use to solve multi-source circuits. Uh, it's not quite as broad as uh, nodal analysis. Uh, for mesh, the circuit has to be planar, which means that uh, you can draw it in such a way that wires don't cross. If you can't do that, then it's not a planar circuit. So basically planar circuits you can think of as like looking like tiles or, or window panes. So I'm going to use the same circuit that uh, is in the uh, nodal example we did just to show you the differences between them. So we had two sources on this and a series of resistors. All right, so this guy out here was 20 volts, one back here was 12, and one ohm for this, two ohms, 10 ohms, four ohms, five ohms. So nodal works with um, Kirchhoff's current law. Mesh works with Kirchhoff's voltage law. So we're basically going to identify loops, sort of minimal sized loops that cover all of the components when we're done. Remember, KVL says the summation of voltage rises must equal the summation of voltage drops. So we write these KVL summations and then we uh, sort of simplify them or write them in terms of Ohm's law, similar to what we did in uh, nodal. All right. All right, so by convention, we write these little loops, these loop currents. Mesh currents are not uh, branch currents. They might coincide with a branch current, but they're not the same thing, right? So we create these in a little clockwise wheel, so to speak, right? They mesh, so like one's going to come down, one's going to come up. That's where the term comes from. So we just sort of say, oh, look, there's one. That's I1, and here's another one. I2, and here's another one, I3. So however many loops you have, that's how many equations you're going to get. So we're going to have uh, three equations, three unknowns, the unknowns being I1, I2, I3. All right. So I just um, come through here and say, all right, what do I have as far as my KVL? So if I look at loop one, first thing I want to do is indicate for each of these currents what the polarities are. Well, two polarities I know, they're fixed, right? That's my power supply, plus minus. Now, as far as I1 is concerned, given this direction, that's going to be plus to minus on the 1 ohm and plus to minus top to bottom on the 2 ohm, All right? Okay, now, as far as I2 is concerned, it's going in this direction, so that's plus to minus bottom to top on the 2, and then plus to minus left to right on the 10, plus to minus top to bottom on the 4. For I3, you see the same thing happening, right? It's coming up through the 4, so it's plus to minus bottom to top, plus to minus right to left, excuse me, left to right on the 5, and then we complete with the power supply. So, all right, KVL says... The drops around these loops have to sum out to zero. The rises have to equal the drops, right? So what do I have in here as far as fixed values? I have this 12 volt. I'm just going to start at ground just for convenience sake. It doesn't have to, but works out conveniently. So I have 12 volts. Now this is positive, okay? Given my, my uh, convention of the current flowing in this clockwise direction, right, plus to minus winds up being a drop, minus to plus would be a rise. Sum of rises must equal sum of drops. Okay, so minus to plus, there's 12 volts. So I've got, I've got this uh, 12 volt source first. Then I have a couple of drops. Okay, I have uh, the drop across R1 and then the drop across R2. So what's the drop across R1? 
Well, it's the current through at times R1, right? It's one ohm times I1. And then we have the drop across R2. What's that? That's two ohms times the current through it. But the current through it is a pair of meshing currents. It's I1 going down and I2 going up. So it's I1 minus I2. Right, so that's my first equation, and you know we're going to collect up our terms and simplify this. So my constant, 12 volts, is sitting out here. Now, what do I have for I1 terms? Well, there's a 1 ohm there, there's a 2 ohm there. So I'm just going to add those together. I got 1 plus 2 times I1. And then there's this negative 2 ohms I2. So I can say, all right, that's, you know, 3. Do that. First equation, done. Moving along to loop 2. What do I have in here? Drop across the 2 ohm, drop across the 10 ohm, drop across the 4 ohm. Right? There are no uh, sources inside this loop, so that's 0 volts. All right. Okay, so what's the drop across the 2 ohm? Well, it's 2 ohms times the current through it. What's the current through it? Well, I'm in loop 2, so the positive direction, if you will, is the assumed direction of I2. So it's I2 minus I1. I1's going in the opposite direction. So that shows up as I2 minus I1. And then second resistor, right, in the loop. That's the 10 ohm. What's the current flowing through that? Well, the only current flowing through that is the, is the uh, I, I2. This is one of those cases where uh, a mesh current coincides with a branch current. And then we have the 4 ohm resistor. So what's the current flowing through that? Well, again, this is a pair of currents. So I2, we're in loop I2, I2 so it's I2 minus the I3. Right, I3 is negative with respect to the direction of I2. All right, same deal. Let's uh, collect up some terms here, simplify things. So I've got my 0. Then um, in terms of my I1s, you know, what do I have for um, I1 values? Well, I see a negative 2 over there. That looks like it's about it. Um, I2s, we got some things, right? We got a 2, got a 10, got a 4. And then we also have an I3 term here, right? We have the 4, four ohm for that. Okay, so let's simplify that. So we've got 0, negative 2, 1. Uh, we've got uh, 16 for the I2. And negative 4 for the I3. Loop three. Okay, this is a little tricky. There's a constant voltage, 20 volts, but notice, given the direction of I3, plus to minus, that shows up as a drop. So we write that as a negative 20 volts. Okay, and then we just do the summation. I got a drop on the 4 ohm, drop on the 5 ohm. So what's the drop on the 4 ohm? Well, it's 4 times the current through I3, because right, that's the loop I'm in, I3 minus I2, which is flowing in the direction opposite. Then we have the 5 ohm times the current through it, which is just I3. So again, simplify this up. I don't have any I1 terms here. We do have a, um, a 4 ohm negative 4 ohm I2 term. And then uh, we've got this 5 and the 4 for the I3. So 
So simplify that up a little bit more. Minus 20. Now, just like I did before in the nodal, I want everything to line up here. Sort of a little skewed here, but I'm going to leave a space for an I1. I have a zero term for an I1. So I'm just going to put zero in here, zero I1s. And just to be consistent about it, I'm going to come back here to my first equation and say that there's uh, zero I3s as well. But in any way, in any case, so I've got a negative four for the I2 term, and then uh, nine for my I3 term. So this is my set of equations, right? I've got this guy up here, this one here, and then this one here. has to have diagonal symmetry. I'll shift this over a little bit, or shift this one back, however you want to do it. Um, if we go through, right, there's a plus 3, a plus 16, plus 9. Everybody else is negative. Here's our symmetry, okay? Um, we would have out here, there's the zeros, there's my minus 2s, there's my minus 4s. So this thing has diagonal symmetry. If you don't have diagonal symmetry, don't go any further. You made a mistake, okay? All right, so we solve this. And when we do, I1 uh, turns out to be 3.954 amps. I2 works out to just shy of um, 69 uh, milliamps, negative. So that tells me that the current's really going in the other direction. All right, this is positive, so I know I1 really is going like this. I2 is negative, so it's really going like this. All right. And then the I3 is a negative 2.253. Same deal. Okay? All right, so in other words, it's really going this way. So let's do a little, a little verification on this thing. How do I know I didn't, you know, punch some numbers into a calculator wrong, or maybe I missed something along the way? So, you know, I'll just verify loop one. You know, you'd really want to do this for all of them, but just to show you how. I look around loop one, and um, I know that this drop plus this drop has to equal this rise. So the VA, what we called this VA originally in the other video, that was VB, but VA is the drop across the 2 ohm, which in our definition is I1 minus I2, that current, times 2 ohms. So you plug these two currents in, right, and you will wind up with 8.046 volts, which not coincidentally, is the value that we got for VA when we did it via nodal. And then, when we look at the 1 ohm, that just happens to be uh, the mesh current flowing through the 1 ohm, right? So, it's just I1 times 1 ohm, which will work out to 3.954 volts. Nothing like uh, multiplying by 1. And if you add these two things together, right, you wind up with 12 volts, which is the rise that you had. So that works great, right? Now, just like the um, uh, by observation technique that you can use in nodal, there is an observation technique for these. If you have nothing but voltage sources, you can get these equations directly. Well, sort of like these middle equations, actually. In other words, these guys, oops, you can get these guys directly. So here's what you do. Look at the loop. Consider your uh, voltage sources, right? If they're going in the direction of, of uh, the assumed clockwise mesh current, they're positive. Otherwise, they're negative. 
So I look at this and I say, okay, I've got a 12 volt source. So there's my 12 volt source. And then you say, what does this current flow through? It flows through the one ohm and the two ohm. One ohm and two ohm. Are there any of those components that have a meshing current? Yeah, the two ohm does. That's I2. So that shows up negative, right? There's the negative two ohms I2. These guys are out here. They're not touched. So there's no I3 term. Moving on to this. What do I have for voltage sources in the loop? I don't have any. Zero. What does this flow through? It flows through a 2, a 10, and a 4. 2, a 10, and a 4. Anything in that group common with loop 1? Yeah, the 2. Shows up negative. Anything in this loop common with 3? Yeah, the 4. Also shows up negative. Done with that loop. Move to the next one. What do I have for sources? 20. Current's going in, so that shows up as a negative 20 volts. What flows, uh, what resistance does that current flow through? The 4 and the 5. Is there anything in that group that's common with loop 2? Yeah, the 4. Shows up negative. Is there anything in that loop that that's common with loop 1? No. So that shows up as 0. And there's your set, right? So by observation, you can get that. So if you had, you know, maybe, uh, just throw this in here real quick. Like if you had another resistor out here, you know, I'd like a 7 ohm resistor. You'd have to create another loop up here. All right, so I'll call that I4. So, um, you know, you'd have four equations with four unknowns. And when you did this loop, you'd say, well, okay, you know, I've got the, the 1 and the 2. The 2 is common with loop 2. There's nothing common with loop 3. The 1 ohm is common with loop 4. Right, so you'd have this come out. So you'd have a you know, you'd have a, uh, a minus 1 I4 over here for that. And the same thing would happen with loop 2, and the same thing would happen with loop 3. And, of course, you'd have to write another equation for loop 4, where you'd have the 1, the 7, the 5, and the 10. All right? So, we wind up with another nice system. If you have current sources, you might want to do a, uh, a source conversion so you wind up with voltage sources and you can do this sort of by observation method or you just do the general approach where you directly apply kvl okay and uh, you know work your way through simplify it collect up your terms until you come up with a set of equations and remember they have to exhibit diagonal symmetry right so as i said 3 16 9 is your diagonal then moving off minus 2 minus 2 0 0 minus 4 minus 4 if you don't have the diagonal symmetry, it is not going to work. Okay.